Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. I just knew it as the State Theater. The buildings downtown and the houses and Old Red, this city reeks of history, beautiful history. It gets me goosebumps when I still tell the story. I'd go to the stage, I'd push the piano out to the middle of the stage and raise the curtain, and I would sing and play to myself to an empty house. And it was inspiring. It's what made me feel good. It's what brought me into a partnership with this theater, and it still does. Because, of course, this was never a part-time job. It's not even a full-time job. It's a life's work. Hello, and welcome to Galveston Unscripted. We have a history-packed episode for you today. I sit down with Maureen Patton, executive director of the Grand 1894 Opera House. Before we hop into this episode, I want to let you know that there will be a bonus episode associated with this one. It's either the episode above or below this one on the podcast feed. You are not going to want to miss this. Here's a quick sample. It's all part of the fabric of what makes this place special because the best ambassadors for Galveston are those people who've been on that stage and they go near and far and they talk about Galveston. Kenny Rogers, William Jennings, Willie Nelson, Hal Holbrook, Itzhak Perlman, James Earl Jones, Darth Vader. (laughs) Maureen discusses some of her favorite acts, performances, and performers. We also discuss what most of the performers say about the Grand Opera House. Let's hop right into this conversation with Maureen Patton, Executive Director of the Grand 1894 Opera House. Maureen, thank you so much for sitting down with me today and to be on the podcast. This podcast, the reach has really extended well beyond what I ever imagined. It's being used for education in schools and universities now. My real goal was just to exhibit Galveston Island and everything that we have to offer now, what we have had to offer in the past, and what we could do here in Galveston in the future. Congratulations. Um, That's a wonderful thing. And I love telling our story. So this is going to be fun. Can you tell me what the Opera House was like before it was restored? It was about as derelict a movie theater as you could get at that time. We wanted people to feel clean and safe when they left here. It was something only a mother could love. I've laughingly said all the hookers knew my name. I hope that's okay to say on a podcast. I never felt unsafe here. Across the street were topless bars. Next to us were some very rough bars. Most of the time I was here by myself, and when I left in the evening... The man who ran the bar next door to us, it was called Dry Dock. I would look and I was parked across the street and he was always standing in the door of the Dry Dock. I figured out in a very short time that he was always watching to make sure I got to my car. And I stepped over the midnight choir almost every morning. We slip covered the seats so that people would come in and they didn't feel like they were sitting on these really awful looking old movie theater seats. And we had security at every show and our block was better lit than the rest of downtown. The floors were sticky with popcorn and soda and anything else. And of course, the ceiling in the orchestra lobby was a drop ceiling with fluorescent lightings. The gorgeous wood that you see in here today was covered in about 12 coats of paint. And it was almost every color of the rainbow. When we chipped away at it and we could see a pale yellow and blue and pink and whatever, and that final coat was maroon. So you had institutional green walls with a lot of water spots on them and this maroon woodwork and just everywhere the smell of mold and stale popcorn. But things happen. And we did a concert on this stage before I was ever involved as either a volunteer or a staff member. So before we get into it here, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I was born and raised here in Galveston. It never occurred to me that I would ever live here again. And it wasn't because I didn't like it. It was just because it never occurred to me. When I went away to school, I was a music major. I met my husband who was in graduate school while I was in undergrad school. We both were at TCU. And when we got married, we lived in other places because we were not only both singers, but he was a choral director. He had another year to serve in the Army. And we spent that first year of our marriage in San Antonio. And we did a whole lot of performing in San Antonio and sang with the Master Singers, which was a part of the symphony and a part of the opera season they did there. And and then started on our way to go to Wichita Falls and from there went to Bay City. And while he was in Bay City, he got a call about a job here at Galveston College. And it was to be head of the music department at Galveston College. We had two very small children. So moving here made sense for all kinds of reasons. When we got here, we did what we'd done in other places. By this time, I had my master's degree. He had his, and 
he was running the department and he was directing the choir. He was teaching music theory, music appreciation, all of those things. And then they hired me to teach voice at Galveston College. And I started doing opera workshop productions because I would get my students and we could perform there at Fort Crockett in the Upper Deck Theater. And we even performed at the Mason Lodge here. And of course, it has some extraordinary drops. All of those Masonic temples do. As things happen, the Opera House was purchased by the Galveston County Cultural Arts Council. It was found, Betty Hilton who was in charge of the theater at Galveston College. And she and her choreographer were looking for a home, any place they could find to do a production. They stumbled into here, which was at the time then the State Theater, and they heard that it was maybe going to be sold, and they started prowling around. And as Betty told it, she was standing on one of the balconies in the auditorium, and Mark Legon, who was her choreographer, was standing on stage, and they started having a conversation. And she said, wow, this is the real deal. This is not a movie theater. What was it like for you when you first arrived at the Opera House? I came to work right as they were finishing the work on the stage so that we could move into this building as our performance space. We had already programmed the 100th anniversary of Anna Pavlova's birth, and it was going to be at the Moody Center. And I had found out that Anna Pavlova danced here at the Grand. So my first call to an agent, the show sometimes naivete probably works in your favor because you don't know enough to know that you should probably be scared to death or not do that at all. I called. You're preaching to the choir on that one. Yeah. And I called the agent. And I said, we've scheduled this Anna Pavlova celebration. I need to move it from the Moody Center over to our opera house. And he said, we can't do that unless we know what the technical specs are and whether or not it will fit and just... I think of this and it's almost embarrassing. And I said, Anna Pavlova played this place. And if she did it, I'm sure that they can. Because I just didn't know enough to be worried. That really was not a very smart thing to say. We later became great friends and I booked a lot of things with him. But they took a look at the specs. At that time, we could only seat 800 people because we could not seat anybody in the grand tier. The place was packed, absolutely packed. And here was Anna Pavlova dancing her choreography in the guise of Star Danaeus on that stage. And it gives me goosebumps when I still tell the story. You and I have talked about the magic of the theater, and we went from there. I would like to cover a little bit on the arts in Galveston and why it is important, and also that the 1894 Opera House is not the first opera house in Galveston. It just happens to be the most grand. Let's start with our story because it is the same story. This is so much the way these opera houses were formed. Some of the ones in the western part of the United States were done as opera houses and bars, and they'd use them for church on Sunday. They would pop up in communities because communities needed that artistic element of how to celebrate, how to come together, how to see something unique, how to just love a performance, whether it was music or theater or dance or whatever it was. This theater got its start after many other theaters here in Galveston. And one of the things I'm so proud of about our book is that it shows all of those theaters that preceded it, starting with 1845. And we didn't start getting built until 1894. So there were others. In our story, it was Henry Greenwall, who was a promoter, and he talked to the businessmen of Galveston and said, I am building a series of opera houses along the Gulf Coast. I think Florida, all the way down this way. And he said, Galveston is the premier city of Texas, and you deserve the finest opera house. And he raised the money to build this place, and it was the Grand Opera House and Hotel. He raised the money to do it in one day, and he raised the money from the businessmen, not from philanthropy, not from people saying, oh, we want to donate to this or anything else. He raised the money from the businesses because he said, this will be good for business. So every time I do a tour, I start with that because it's important to remember that the arts are certainly key to our emotional health and everything else, but they're also key to just surviving and surviving in a way that is financially feasible. So he raised the money and they built this whole complex in seven months. So it was built in 1894. It opened on January 3rd, 1895. When we had a 100th year celebration, it was the season of 94. That's the way it worked. We pretty much thrived. There were some wonderful things that happened in those early years. 
And then this little thing called the 1900 storm came along. So barely, barely got our feet wet. And all of a sudden we're faced with this. And the devastation of this theater and the hotel was enormous. Blew out the back wall of the theater. The whole roof came off, including the majestic cupola that made this building stand out. And bricks everywhere. We've got the photos, just piles of bricks that came off the back wall. And that was September 8th of 1900. In October of 1901, this place was back open for business. I had a hard time just wrapping my brain around that. And when I would tell that to a tour group, I would say, I don't have anything anywhere that says this is the way they did it. This is why it reopened. I said, my feeling is that it reopened because the Grand was a place that was non-sectarian, apolitical. It was, there was nothing about it that said you had to be one thing or another. It was for the community. And somebody in this community, I think, felt that it was important to get people back in here because it would be part of the healing from the most horrific disaster in the history of this place. Barely a year later, there we were, reopened. And then we went through going back into doing live performances. And then the vaudeville years came up after that. That segued into some movies and then movies that were not the finest movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's a good way to put it. Yeah. And and became a derelict movie theater. But it was a really active vaudeville place and a live performing arts theater. And it was built the way European opera houses were built. And they did everything there. They just did everything there. We were part of the the movement of establishing a League of Historic American Theaters. We were a charter member. And it was to get these people, these oddballs like us, together to talk about what are the challenges. Because we had challenges different from other places. For one thing, we weren't new. And we had crises that other people didn't have. And so it was important to have that. And the organization is thriving today. Can we talk a little bit about the architectural elements of the building when it was built and also the lighting systems? When it was built, it had this majestic cupola on the building. That was part of the hotel. It gave it the dramatic look that I wish that we still had because now we have a flat roof thanks to 1900. We had gasoliers in the lobbies. And that was because we had one part of the chandelier or the lighting sconce would go up and those were the gas ones and two pieces would go down and those were the electric ones because they weren't sure electricity was here to stay. The lobbies were fairly dark. When we redid this building, we have more lighting than they ever had because it was a very dim set of lobbies. So when we did the restoration, we wanted to be true to the fact that we had these gasoliers. That was part of the structure. The stage used footlights, as a lot of the theaters did. And there was one place that we found a mention that they had gas footlights at one point. So that's why all these theaters were also fire traps. That's Everybody worried about theaters. We had the old way of the dimmer system that had these what looked like huge wheels with a big handle on it. And that's the way you lowered and raised the lights. It was the same system they used at Radio City Music Hall in New York. And they still have those. We have one piece of them that we saved and they probably weigh, I can't even imagine what the weight is. I can't even lift up one corner of them. It's the same system they have over at the at the Masons Temple over there. And, and it's a wonderful system. And that's what everybody had. Not any new structure, but that's what they had. We had an orchestra pit because that was one of the things. To be a grand, you have to have a, a specific place for the orchestra. So we had the pit. It was not as deep as what our pit is today. And we had, I guess, what was normal at that time in terms of the kind of seats we had. They were very narrow. We seated over 1,600 people in this place when it was built. We seat 1,040 pushing every seat we've got today. Can you imagine how hot it was in there? Can you imagine how skinny those people were? (laughs) And little, not just skinny, they were probably little. And they had the windows open. And in wool clothes, you know, those, oh my gosh, those heavy clothes that they wore and all the rest of it. No deodorant. And no deodorant, probably not, no. So that was the way it kept growing. And then as it became a vaudeville house, and at one point, Mr. Martini did put some air conditioning in here, and that was a good thing. And then the movies really just took over, and it became a first-run movie house. I remember seeing Psycho in here. I remember seeing In Love Me Tender in here with my best friend. And we laughed all the way through. We were so irreverent. And there were girls crying their eyes out because Elvis died 
and we're giggling because we thought it was just the worst. So there's so many people who have so many memories here. The first box we sold, well, we redid it and we had boxes, was the family of their parents who had their first date and sat in a box. You have all these wonderful memories that people will share with you, and it's so special. So we, so the movies were really primary because they weren't doing a whole lot of live theater. Once vaudeville started moving into movies, occasionally they would do like an amateur hour and they would do that between the movie times. But it it was a first run movie house. And then the story I love is a Tex Ritter and some of your audience may remember who Tex Ritter is, some may not, but he was one of the cowboy kings back in the day. He was before Roy and Gene Autry and some of those, but he came in, rode his horse into the theater into the lobby, and then up the aisle and onto the stage, and then did his presentation to the screaming kids who loved it. And it was in the mid-40s. What a treat to to have that. Can you tell me about the animals used in the shows? We've had a lot of animals. We had the horses in Ben-Hur way back on a treadmill. Each of them had a treadmill with a screen behind them that rolled so it looked like they were running the chariot race. And that one... They had to reinforce the stage because that's a lot of weight on the stage because it also had a cast of 300 people. We had a circus kind of show come in with camels. When they left town, the camels left their fleas here. So we had to fumigate the place and move on. That was a long time ago. That was before my time. We had a pony in an opera that Houston Baptist University did here for Pagliacci or Johnny Skiki. They did two one acts and the pony and a little wagon was in there. We've had a lot of dogs. Marilyn May used to bring her dog on stage with her. I know that the Opera House has undergone major restoration. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So when we started our restoration and then we hit another hurricane, by the time by the time I came along, it was 2008, we had been restored since we reopened in 86. And we did almost what they did when they built the building. We closed in June of 85 And then started in 1986 with just Katie bar the door. We were off and running and we had this gorgeous theater, so many good things happening. And that was fine until 2008. And then I came along. We had a little bit of damage in Alicia and mostly it was over the stage. And so we had to send all the curtains out to be re-fireproofed and we had to clean every lighting instrument, everything else. It didn't touch the, it didn't touch the auditorium. And those were all the slip covered seats. Those were, it was not like it was pristine over there, but we got that done and we did all that repair work in a matter of a couple of months. But here we are after Ike and we've got water up to row L covering all those seats. We had a little piece of roof open up backstage. And so we had some damage in the star dressing room, but the entire orchestra pit and everything under that stage was full of water, including the nine foot Steinway Grand. Our architect, Killis Allman, a preservation architect from San Antonio, has been the architect here for all the 40 years that I've been here. We have done this together. And he said, this is the theater that will never be finished. And it's true because every time we think we're about finished, something new has come up that we need to address. We have rebuilt the entire north wall of the building, one brick at a time, five rows of brick thick, where they remove bricks in about a three foot area and tuck point the most inside brick layer and then remortar every brick that went into that wall. And those bricks, once you took the slurry off of it, could be pulled out without even using a chisel. And you could blow on them and the mortar would just blow away. That was a big clue for us that this whole building was built with mortar that probably had a lot of beach sand in it. So there's always something. We're a 127-year-old building. It was not something that was going to stay forever. And here we were over 100 years old. And so what we've been doing is rebuilding a wall at a time. We have rebuilt the facade. We have done the entryway, but we still have the west wall, which is slapdash up against the stage deli and then has a whole pathway of other buildings that that front onto a 21st street that wall has to be done and then we have two interior walls that were built as part of the opera house and hotel when they were standalone buildings except for the entry of the box office we're like a u on its side so that's the connection between the two buildings but the hotel building and the Opera House theater part 
had a vacant spot of about four feet between those two buildings. And there were windows on the street side where the hotel was, on the interior wall of the hotel, on the interior wall of the opera house, and then the alley wall of the opera house. And that was their ventilation. You think about that, and that's the way people dealt with it. When we did the north wall, we estimated it was over several hundred thousand bricks that we were repointing. I found it fascinating. I said, I go and I park my car and I just watch them because there's an artistry to bricklaying. And I had one of, one of my board members say, I went back there and I watched it. It was worse than watching paint dry. I was so offended. <laughs> I, was just, I was crushed. I found it so interesting because these guys are artists. They're masters. We were the anchor that really spurred a lot of the development, obviously, on Post Office Street. And we were one of the developments that helped to continue to spur the development of the downtown cultural arts district because we were nighttime. We were weekends. People like to go eat dinner before the show. They want to dress up. They might go buy something new. They might go to the cleaners. They have to fill the car with the gas, whatever. It is such an economic stimulus to, to have a place like this. And when I've spoken to a lot of historic theaters, groups that want to do their theater, and I've made a lot of visits like that, and I'll say, here's your argument for it. This is what you will do for your economy. This is what, in our case, we do for the visitation because over 75% of our audience comes from out of town. And it's about an 80-mile radius. And then we also have people who come from out of state. We had people from everywhere in the country who would fly in. So there's so much more to restoration. I can tell just by sitting here and talking to you that you are so passionate. You have dedicated your life to this. Could you tell me more about how you stumbled into this position of historic preservation of a place like the Grand Opera House? So we did what we always did when we went to a new community. I volunteered for things and I got involved with the Arts Council. I became the program chair. And so I was helping them plan the program and they had gotten some money so they could do the stage. And that was key to really the restoration of this place. The first thing that happened was the restoration of the stage because you couldn't really operate as a live performing theater if the stage did not work as a live stage has to. So a lot of the shows in those earlier years were done at the old Moody Civic Center. And then they hired a new person to run the Arts Council, known really for her fundraising abilities. And I was on the board at that time. Because the person who was the production person left, the Arts Council was looking for a person to run the Opera House and to run the Arts Center, the two biggest projects the Arts Council had. And so one night, Larry and I were talking. And kids were asleep. And he said, in essence, have you decided yet what you want to be when you grow up? What about that job? And I said, I don't know. And he said, that's the job for you. I have no idea why he thought that. He thought I could do just about anything, but I had not thought about it. So I, it was fascinating that he did. And so I called the next day. I said, so Jan, what are you doing about that job? She said, you know me, I'm a good Presbyterian I just think God's going to drop somebody in my lap. Do you know somebody? And I said, Larry thinks it should be me. And she said, are you serious? I said, I don't know. I said, because I really don't think I want to go to work full time yet. The kids are in middle school. I gave her all the reasons why. And she said, come in, let's talk about it. So she hired me starting September 1 of 1981 for 30 hours a week. And in the first six months of work, I had accumulated almost 700 hours of comp time. Because, of course, this was never a part-time job. It's not even a full-time job. It's a life's work, and it's a passion. And the first time I met colleagues who all were running historic theaters, I realized that we were a breed unto ourselves. When I started, we had just gotten our Steinway piano, our nine-foot Steinway, and so that was 82. I kept music in my desk, and when we'd gotten the piano at the end of the day, I was the only person here. There, there was only really one and a half of us at that point. And I would take my music. I'd go to the stage. I'd push the piano out to the middle of the stage and raise the curtain. And I would sing and play to myself to an empty house. And it was inspiring. It's what made me feel good. It's what brought me into a partnership with this theater. And it still does. And occasionally I'll give somebody a tour. And if, and if I'm just feeling sort of perky or whatever. And I'll talk about the acoustics because the place was built for great acoustics. And I'll just pop out a high note just to just to let them hear that. 
So that was what brought me to this. And 40 years later, here I am. I feel like I should break into a course of I'm still here from Follies. And you are a true yeah. performer. Yeah. Well, I yeah. Yes. <laughs> I know there had to be so many struggles in the beginning when all of this restoration was going on in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I said to a friend at one point who was questioning me about why I would do this because it did not have a good financial history. GHF was struggling with the Alyssa. The Arts Council was struggling with this place. And one of my friends who admitted to being the one who said this, by the way, when he was given an award here, <laughs> said, I'm the one who said, dig a channel up 21st Street and drag the Alyssa up there and berth it next to the Opera House and you'll have both white elephants in one place. And I heard that and I just laughed and I thought it was funny and I understood where that came from. And then those are probably two of the most iconic pieces of mm. Galveston history that are active, mm. living, kind of living pieces. Without the struggles and the people putting their passion behind it and the love behind it in not only what they're working on, like the Opera House or the Alyssa, but Galveston in general in the 70s, 80s and 90s, we wouldn't have what we have today, which is this premier destination in Texas and the South to see historic landmarks. I've told people when I've taken taken them on a tour and I said the biggest blessing for us is that nobody had the money to tear this place down and build something different. Houston lost all of their historic theaters. They had a couple of movie palaces on Main Street that were just glorious and they tore them down because they wanted to build new and better. And, and we were blessed by not having that happen here. One final question. It's really two. And I started asking this a few podcasts ago. I'm going to frame it a little bit differently. The question is, why is history important? But I'm not going to ask you that question. I'm going to ask you, why is preserving this place, which is such a historical place for Galveston, important? I think preservation is so important anyway. My mother was a huge preservationist. She finally got my dad to agree they could buy a house, this great house on Winnie. It was just, it was in her soul. And three out of my four grandparents all immigrated here. Actually, four, all four of them. Three from Italy, one from what was Yugoslavia. And before that, it was Austria, and then it became Croatia. And they keep changing names over there. My great-grandmother and my great-great-grandmother were both Protestant missionaries in Italy. A Protestant Italian is a rare thing, and that's what I am, and that's what my whole family is. And the, I grew up with stories about how that worked for them and how they were determined then to come to this country and start an Italian-speaking Protestant con congregation uh, for the people who had who'd immigrated here. And they were all about history. We think we've got history. Oh, my word. But we're babies. And so all of that was part and parcel of my growing up. I was sad because I didn't get to go to the old ball high school. They just moved the other ones a few classes before me. Just moved over there. The big, beautiful the building. The big, beautiful building with the dome. And, and it was, there was just so much richness in it. And I came to this theater and I went to the martini. I knew the history of martini, certainly. I didn't know all the history of this one. I just knew it as the state theater. But the buildings downtown and the houses and every and old red, this city reeks of history. Beautiful history. It's a good way How to put it. How would you not want to preserve that? And all of us in the historic theater business believe fervently with every every fiber of our being that when you come to a historic theater for a performance, you are enriched by all that's around you. You get an extra dose of something. Part of that has to do with the artists themselves getting inspired by where they are and what they're doing. Part of it is just the surrounding and knowing that this place was a survivor. This place survived the 1900 storm when it would have been so easy to finish tearing it down. There was so much gone. It survived Ike. It survived two pandemics because it survived the early one and now it survived this one. So when people would say to me, you seem to be really doing all right with the fact that you've got a building that's been devastated by Ike. And I said, we're going to get, we're going to get through it. I didn't let anybody go. I said, we've got a job to do. You need to go fix your houses because everybody got hurt at home, including me. But I said, then you come here. And we're, we've got a season to reschedule. I had already talked to the my contractor. We stood on that stage late September. And I said, okay, here's the plan. Looking out at the soggy seats, I want to reopen in January. And he said, what year? And I said, oh, this coming January. It's our 114th birthday. 
And I said, we need to do what they did after 1900. We don't have as much damage as they had in 1900. We have to do it quicker. We have more complicated damage, like air conditioning and stuff like that. And then, and he's looking at me, and you could tell the way he's looking at me, and he thought, she's going around the bend, that it's been too much for her. And then I said, now, here's the thing. We don't have to be finished. We just have to be ready. And then he gave me that look again. What on earth is this woman talking about? And I said, he said, what does that mean? I said, if you can work four days a week and turn it over to me on the weekends, once we open, then get all the stuff done that needs to be done. You got to make sure the stage works, the air conditioning, the bathrooms, the lighting, the all the stuff. And by the way, we have to replace all the seats, not just the ones that are wet because they won't match unless we do. So you turn it over to me. I'll reschedule everything. We'll work around you if you can work around me. And he's just standing there scratching his head. And he would mutter to himself, don't have to be finished, have to be ready. You could just see it. And then he looked at me and he said, okay, I'll make it happen. And then I thought he's the one who'd lost his mind. He absolutely <laughs> drank the Kool-Aid. I was serving a big bucket of Kool-Aid. And they did it. And we opened on January 3rd. They were putting in the last of the seats. We had our birthday party. And over 2,000 people came through that afternoon. And I had a sold out show of Jerry Jeff Walker that night. And he handed me a check to help with the repairs. We went through 1900. That to me served as a model for how we get through 2008. I also happened to have grown up with a father who was hardwired to be positive. And he used, my brother and I used to get really annoyed because if we ever complained about something, he would say, You need to look on the bright side. This could be a whole lot worse. And I got that from him. So when somebody said, How do you, what made that work? I said, Well, you can thank my father. You have to look. Somebody asked me, said, how do you get up in the morning? I said, I really believe that when the door slams, the window opens. We've gone through such difficulty, such difficulty, but we're a survivor. Galveston is a survivor. You don't believe in the no. And the no usually is the one that's on my shoulder perched to say, you're not going to be able to pull that off. All you can do is try. And all of this history that is just embedded on this island is what draws people here. And it was one thing to be the Wall Street of the Southwest, but now we are so much more because we have survived and we've preserved so much. There are cities that have just mowed it down. We've been able to preserve it thanks to people like you and thanks to foundations and organizations and families and all these entities that are willing to give money and support the community and what we have here today. So yeah, I want to thank you for preserving the arts and culture and everything we have here in Galveston, especially this landmark on Post Office Street and in Galveston. So is there anything else you want to say, closing remarks, anything you want to plug? Having the plague and then we had the locusts and I don't want to know what's next. I just, I'm just moving on. But the fact that, that we can do that and obviously with a lot of help from a lot of people it makes a statement finally, nationally, about how valuable the arts are. Nobody's going anywhere. We're going to get through this, but we have to make plans. I think if you don't look on the bright side, you are doomed to just curl up in a little ball and not do anything. Spoken from a true Galvestonian. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we had a lot of damage at our house after Ike. So I was looking at that and I was doing here, but I said, just do what you need to do there. We've got things we've got to do here. And there are still people there's still generations from those early families who still love that. They love being a part of it, being the f part of the fabric. It's, it's funny that you say that over the past few weeks, this the podcast is getting, I'm hearing from people all over the country and people who've never even visited here are listening to the podcast and doing research on Galveston because their family either immigrated through here. They have family ties to this place. And it's just interesting, like, this little sandbar means so much to uh, so many people in the country, in the state, that people are really starting to figure that out now and really do research I on where their family came from. a bright spot in what is otherwise can be a pretty dreary world. And I think that's what the artists who play here sense. And I think that's what, if the residents are listening to all that goes on and paying attention, that's what they value. They grab hold of that. And I think that's so important. Thank you for listening in to Galveston Unscripted. I am very excited to present a Galveston Unscripted bonus episode. Maureen is an amazing storyteller. I sat there for half an hour listening to every story, not really realizing that we weren't directly talking about history and historic preservation, which is what this podcast is really all about. But I decided to release this episode as bonus content or behind the scenes. 
Here's a quick sample. It's all part of the fabric of what makes this place special because the best ambassadors for Galveston are those people who've been on that stage and they go near and far and they talk about Galveston. But Kenny Rogers, William Jennings, Willie Nelson, Hal Holbrook, it's at Perlman, James Earl Jones, Darth Vader. <laughs> Maureen discusses some of her favorite acts, performances, and performers. We also discuss what most of the performers say about the Grand Opera House. It's either the episode above or below this one on the podcast feed. You are not going to want to miss this. Please go rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you find podcasts. And if you want to keep up with Galveston Unscripted, follow us on social media. We are literally everywhere. Thank you to all of those who have already reached out to us to let us know what you think about this podcast. And thank you to all those who've recommended episodes and topics. Most of them are already in the works. So if you haven't reached out yet, let us know what you thought about this episode. Reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You can send me an email. Just check out the link in the description below. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. Tell us what you want to hear. Tell us what you don't want to hear. Any feedback is appreciated. Once again, thank you for listening to Galveston Unscripted, and we'll see you next time. For historic resources or more information, check out the episode description.